believer does not believe most of the teachings of Brother Jackson. He used the example of the seventh seal not being revealed yet. Since January 2021, God has been dealing with me. And once again, I went looking and found out Fairhope Congregation sermons are being streamed on YouTube. So I made myself an unofficial member. I watch the services online, but I would like to know if there is a true believing congregation that I can fellowship with in Maryland. Meanwhile, in the absence of that, may I plead to fellowship with you online and that streaming be always done for me to be able to hear the word of God. And he gave me his contact information and everything. I, I, I've, I've sent an email to him in, in response to more or less expressed to Brother Kennedy, or he signs his name Brother Ken, that uh, in the Maryland area I, I have no knowledge of um, yes. any that have believed the things or followed Brother Jackson's teachings and um, in congregations and um, the actual whenever I got to looking at it, the actual closest uh, assemblies to him would be um, in Louisville or Atlanta and uh, or Cartersville and so I, I put that information in the email I sent to him and, and also how to find Brother Tim's uh, website and how that he can, um, Brother Tim's website gives uh, listings of other ministers and makes available messages from <coughs> other parts of the ministry that he can uh, learn to familiarize himself with and, and to receive edification. And that they're there for the edification of the body of Christ. And, and so we just, I was thought I'd uh, just read that. If Brother Kennedy, he, he tunes in to this message. Brother, we love you. Uh, it's humbling to my heart to know that God has used um, or has referred his heart to us Amen. and um, and it lets you know that the word of God it um, he, you never know what the Lord is doing Amen. in your life you don't know who's watching you you don't know who who actually becomes exposed to you as a body of Christ and um and I pray, I, I, in my email, I prayed, uh, I told him I, we would, we longed for the day that uh, maybe in, up ahead that, uh, that he can pay us a visit so we can shake his hand and hug his neck and let him know that we love him and, uh, and that we appreciate the hunger for God that the Lord brings about in the heart. And so we just pray that the Lord would help him and uh, and we're thankful. Um, and uh, I gave him more information on how to contact me, but good luck. <laughs> you know, most of the time you get to, you get my wife before you get me. And so, um, but anyways. And Elmer can testify to that. <laughs> So now we're turning back to Leviticus 23. And um, Lord willing, I even put a bug in his ear that we're going to have uh, meetings in Colvin or in Hartzell uh, in July. And uh, if he has a means or an ability, I'd like to help plan a trip for him and uh, come and be in fellowship, and uh, we'll be passing out whatever information to, 
or do you, you've got it on the board already? Uh, it's on the board already. If, if in your heart you desire to plan to go to the services, then uh, there's a certain time, I think, in mid-June where we're going to have to have um, a head count to give a better idea for how to, for them to how to know how to cater. And uh, so we look forward to those services. So, and I'm thankful that we're going to, uh, unless something else happens, that we have an opportunity <laughs> to plan for services and meetings like that. I'm just thankful that we're able to uh, gather together and the Lord's lifted the fear off of off of our hearts in a great measure and uh, and he's put us into a, a greater sense of normalcy here and I, I'm thankful for that so um, as we turn then uh, back to Leviticus 23 and we're going to start here I guess we'll start here at the 14th verse again, just to relate. As we're going to start looking, we're going to look at really at what this uh, Feast of Pentecost and how it's joined with this, uh, what is spoken here, of the seven days unleavened bread, it's all speaking about this Feast of Pentecost. Uh, the Lord put it, there, in this first series of three feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, just to show how that uh, by the crucifixion of Christ and His resurrection, it opened up a new covenant. It uh, established uh, a better covenant. The Apostle Paul said, if, it, if the old covenant was the best one, then there had been no reason for the Lord to bring a new one. But because there is a new covenant, it goes to show that the one before, it wasn't the best one. It was just declaring one that would be better. And this better covenant is what the Feast of Pentecost was uh, observed to declare. And within this, uh, the feast, as far as how the Lord details it to, to be observed by the Jews and the nation of Israel, it tells and gives a reflection of what the purpose or you might say what the Lord's desire and he purposes to accomplish inside of our life so that we might end up at the end of this age and you and I are that generation that lives at the end and that we can have expectation of harvest not harvesting others but that we will be the harvest. <laughs> That's what I, I want to be, the ultimate harvest for the Lord. And, well, we want to harvest as many as we can for the kingdom of God in this, but I want to have uh, this work of God in my life to have its full benefit or its full accomplishment in my life. So it starts here in verse 14. You shall neither eat bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Once he ended that old covenant and the new covenant is established, then there's no way that you can be uh, benefited by the Word of God looking at the old again. 
it doesn't, it doesn't bring uh, any accomplishment in the life. But now that it's been established and we live under this new covenant, which is you must be born again of water and of spirit. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's this covenant that we have entered into. And except that you have been born again, except that you have received the Spirit of God in your life, it's fruitless, really, uh, to... You won't gain anything out of the Word of God that's really beneficial. It might give you principles because there's many that uh, they use the words of Jesus. They use, I remember when uh, Barack Obama was uh, president and there was times that he reflected on certain things that were spoken and a lot of the ones that were uh, national leader. You see them up there, politicians up there using and and words of Christ that this is the way to live by. And most of the time they use it and they twist it because they want to drive their agenda with it. And, it, and it's really uh, has no life in its purpose at all the way they use the words. And yet they read it right from the pages. And yet in much of it, because you have uh, many of the Democratic Party today standing up and, and uh, using the Word of God, using quotes from Scripture and all that, that what they want to push in this socialist uh, agenda and those things, that it's uh, something guided by the Word. And we know that it's no fruit in that. So... They're, they're looking at the Word of God without the Spirit of God inside. And the Word of God without the Spirit of God applied to it is dead. It has no life in it. The quickening Spirit, that's what's made it alive inside of our heart. And we're thankful for the Lord he allows us, and now we can look at things that seem like that they have no life in them, but they become living inside of you. Whenever you look at how it reflects over into the work that God puts and that he's doing in your life. There's almost no circumstance, no scripture, no setting in scripture that you can look at that can't benefit you and won't speak to your heart sometimes allow you to, uh, to kind of um, place yourself right in that position or in that same spiritual mind or that same place that somebody uh, in Scripture reflected and God speak to you and show how that He can be your comfort and your help and your deliverer. And there's so many things in Scripture that just comes alive because you are eating this Word with the Spirit of God being your stimulator and bringing that Word alive. And you shall count from the morrow after the Sabbath from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So he's taking it right from this day. The feast of first fruits. When that first fruit offering was on, it was on the morrow after the Sabbath, after the Passover. From that time you count seven Sabbaths. Those seven Sabbaths, they're telling the same thing that these seven days are. They express this is a work of God under that new covenant that has been initiated. It's just the Lord confirming and showing. He's began a work in here 
that's reflected with this, and it's all the same work. Remember in this, what was established is that on the first day there was a holy convocation. They witnessed this resurrection. That generation witnessed that resurrection. And that was the, uh, you might say, the power of their gospel. Because they had record of it. And they didn't just say, we hear, we heard of a resurrection. They said, we saw it. The Apostle Paul, as he wrote uh, about... Uh, Christ's resurrection in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He spoke of how that he appeared to Peter and he appeared to James. Then at last he appeared to me <laughs> as one born out of season. And his testimony, his witness was not just hearsay. It was the actual knowledge and experience. And they spoke it with authority. And it left a foundation. Because the foundation is Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Regardless of whatever anyone can say or however anyone can approach Things of God, if it doesn't come and show Jesus Christ crucified, born, buried, and raised again, then, brother and sister, it'll be a fruitless gospel because this is what gives it life. He, he rose from the dead. In the power of resurrection, there's a promise. They witnessed that first day or that first holy convocation and then on the seventh day it's declared there will be a holy convocation so all the works being done in here so that those that are part of this that are living in that season of time of the seventh day when he comes for harvest can have expectation in their heart that he's coming for me I want to be part of his harvest. It said, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. This is new meat. It's not based on that old law. It's not where we have to approach uh, you know, because under that old law, under that old covenant, he said, and he told the children of Israel, he said, you'll go into the promised land and the day will come when I will choose a place to put my name. Hello, brother. And, uh, and I will choose a place to put my name in where he chose that place, then it was demanded, it was a command of the Lord that Israel would approach that, would approach them these certain times of the year. They had to give attention to the Lord and go to that place. But here, this new meat offering, so you shall bring out of your habitations, so, instead of the Lord choosing a place where you have to go and appear before Him, this new covenant, He's going to come to you. He's coming to your habitation. He's made it very personal and not some place there that you're required to attend. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, sometimes... Uh, Mankind, he puts that kind of, uh, what do you say, bondage, leverage upon the hearts of people. That, oh, you got to give attention here or you're, you're going to be gone. 
And I have to say, brother and sister, give your attention to him. Give your attention to him. He's going to make sure his people are joined together. That's a promise he's made to himself. He's going to join the body of Christ. That's not something he's depending on you to do and me to do. He's going to fitly join the body. He's going to bring it about. He'll accomplish it in his measure, in his time, the way he was. It's going to require our efforts and our diligence, but it don't require your plan. He don't need, he didn't, don't need your good idea on how to do it. A lot of times men think that's what effort is, is coming up with the best idea that we all can agree with. No, you give your attention to him as he's ordered us to bring an offering to him. If I bring my offering to him the way that he has told me, because he's going to deal intimately with my heart. He's going to deal with me on a measure that, he, that nobody knows. your habitation how did you have to go you have to, you're required to go to Fairhope assembly that's not the answer you have to go before the Lord let him come into your habitation you come into my if he comes into my habitation, He's going to lead me in a way that's going to join me with every member of the body of Christ without schism. Because that's what Paul foresaw. The body of Christ, for it to function and for it to be edifying to Christ, has got to function without schism or strife or any such thing. And so if those schisms are there, then it's impossible for it to be a reflection of the body of Christ. And so he's going to deal with my heart to get all the schisms out of me. <laughs> all, all those things that uh, make schisms fertile ground in me. He's going to deal with me. That's his, uh, that's his promise that you'll bring out of your habitations two loaves of two-tenths deals, this gallon of flour. You know, we never even knew. Before I come to know Christ, I never even knew I had a gallon of flour in me. And this is the, this is the wondrous thing to me. He searches out the earth. He finds all that are his. Everyone that has this flower in them, he finds them. There was a day he found me. Because I had it in me. makes the call he deals with the heart and it's for Jew and Gentile that's what these two loaves are speaking of before it was just all one loaf 
that could be made. Matter of fact, on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come and this came out, you know what come out of that upper room? 121 loaves. <laughs> you might say, 120 of one loaf. 120 Jews come out. And 3,000 were added that day. But they were all one loaf out of that one loaf. And time went on for a number of years or a number of months. And then the day came that the Lord took that one loaf, Peter, and sent him to Cornelius' house. And when he got to preaching about the gospel, all of a sudden, this resurrection power that's in Christ, it came into Cornelius and all his household that heard. And on that day, they looked around and they saw an extra, another loaf that they never expected to see. They knew it was all going to be, they, they had no problem with seeing that one loaf that was there. But this is a covenant that opened up the way. Peter had to look and say, I see the Lord is no respecter of persons. This feast has two loaves of leaven. See, because you can, it says, it says, they shall be a fine flour, and they shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits. Well, does anyone have a problem understanding you have leaven? <laughs> Is that easy to comprehend? That we are leavened, I fit that loaf. I didn't know I had the fine flour. And really when I was a sinner, I didn't even regard I was leavened. I had no knowledge of fine flour or leaven. But whenever I was, it was mingled with oil and that wine stimulated my heart, it opened my eyes to realize that the Lord has began a work inside me. He wants a new creature. And I still got this old loaf with me too. And this is part of the offering. And yet, if I observe and I recognize I come to that realization so that I can allow his spirit to work and deal in my life, I have an expectation to be of the first fruits of the Lord. Blessed and holy is he who has their part in the first resurrection. You have expectation that you can be a part of that kingdom because of the work that's starting inside of you. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullet, and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord, with their meat offering, their drink offerings, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. That's what he wants to make of me, a sweet savor unto him. And this promise has started all the way back on the day of Pentecost. When that 120 came out of the upper room. But it extends through every church age. Let this, you see in Revelation, the first chapter, John, he saw Jesus Christ in his high priestly garments. And he was standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And he said, those seven candlesticks are the seven churches. This has been the promise throughout every age. 
Jesus Christ has been the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same one. This has been a work going in progress. And even, even though some, this offering, has been, it's been there for whatever age the body of Christ has gone through. It's been the same offering, the same offering of the Lord. He was that one young bullet. Only one needed to die. He died. And that one sacrifice, he doesn't, he's not required to go back again and again because of the content of my sin. He made one sacrifice. And that one sacrifice is what my relationship with God hinges on. That's what gives me faith and confidence. He will get me into that perfect state he wants me in. He's working in my life. In your life. He's getting us there. Jew and Gentile. And I'll have to say, brothers and sisters, Jew and Gentile throughout this whole age. Oh, but it became a work of, among the Gentiles. The seven church ages is just a Gentile work. No, it's an individual work. You don't know how many Jews were drawn in throughout these ages. But they didn't come by virtue of their nation. They came because they heard the gospel and it pricked their ears and their conscience and they became invested in this work. I have no knowledge to know How many would have been added to the church through the ages? None at all. Because, but I could tell you that whenever you look in Revelation 7, and it says a number, no man can number, which are white robed saints, and we understand there's, uh, that, that this is all in this time. They're not necessarily, they're not, categorized as bride but they're, ca they're still dead in Christ through all this time and they've washed their robes white we don't know how many Jews might be mingled in that because they're out of every tongue and kindred and nation it's just based upon how the gospels move but every Jew that is a part of the kingdom of God in this area it's because they're drawn by their individual per person, just like we are. And you know what it did for them if they heard the gospel and they, and they submitted or they gave their life over to it? It made adversaries of their own household. So that's what the kingdom of God does. Jesus said, think I came to bring peace? I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Right? That, and your enemies won't be foreigners in a strange land coming against you, but enemies will be your enemies of your own household. Because fathers will turn on wives and mothers and children and all that, and, and these will become your enemies and adversaries. And yet, brother and sister, in the natural, you don't look at them and say, that's my enemy. Or there's an enemy. And they don't look at you from the natural and say, you're my enemy. But the gospel that you have heard, that's changed you from the creature you once was, that has drawn you from partaking of the things that you once lived in, when they were pleased to dwell with you, that part until their heart is touched by the gospel, they despise and they look at in a negative way. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, that is the division of the body of Christ or, or of the work of God in this covenant. It's not always uh, pleasant. 
but he is faithful. <laughs> I have to say, brother and sister, when you look into uh, those uh, the first age, I mean, that's what it made a lot of the p- pagans that believed the gospel that the those Jewish apostles were preaching. It converted them from their pagan religion. And the report from communities was that because they despised these men with this gospel, with this doctrine. That the silversmith there was losing business because people were being converted to Christianity. And so they wasn't buying those idols. And he started a riot. And they blamed it all on Paul. And their testimony was, they, they've changed, they've turned the world upside down. <laughs> well, that wasn't a compliment. They wasn't complimenting them. They were despising them. They, want, they hated what was happening. And I have to say, you don't have to uh, you don't have to ask for confrontation within those that you love that are unbelievers. It can come very readily to you <laughs> and everything. And yet it doesn't necessarily mean they don't love you as a person. But that part that has been changed by this gospel is something that uh, well it convicts you for one thing and it brings sometimes the worst of you but I'll say Would you want to change that condition if it meant giving up what you've experienced? No, I love my Lord. I I pray, I pray the Lord will have effect upon their life. See, I know he can save the lowest sinner. I'm living testimony of it. He he introduced himself. He put a new meat offering in my life. I want to come before him. There was a time I didn't. There was a time I despised. That that doesn't necessarily mean you're unreachable. Because he reached me. He saved me. But I look at that one young bullet who had no sin. And he hung up there. For my sake, that I could be introduced to this gospel, me old Gentile. And he wants to make it possible that I can be a burnt offering to the Lord, a sweet savor. That's what the Apostle Paul was pointing at when he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to present your bodies as living sacrifices unto the Lord, holy and acceptable. Well, you're not going to do it by works. It's by your faith in him that he has paid this price and made it possible. He's going to do something in your life. 
His objective is to make you a sweet savior. And the way for that to do is that then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering. I can identify with that one. I know leaven abides here. And even though I have a born again experience and I'm invested in this kingdom, I know that that nature of sin is very, what do you say, pronounced. It's very much still there. And two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. So every now and then, that kid shows up. That kid of the goats. I don't have to ask it to. <laughs> but every now and then, I find myself Behaving, thinking, acting like something I ought not. Not like Christ. And you can't. Every time you express that nature that's not like Christ, this kid shows up. This offering comes because it's got to be made. This is all throughout this age for Jew and Gentile. Those two realms, they're always identifying. This is going, it is for every individual, every believer. There are times when that kid is identified to my face because I trust in his sacrifice. I have faith in it and his word speaks to my heart and identifies the life that is in Christ and that I am not expressing what Christ would want me to. Whenever, whenever that shows up, I have to find an altar of repentance. That's where the sin offering's made. This gets down to everyone. If, if you want to be a sweet savor unto the Lord, you have to make this sacrifice, this sin sacrifice of repentance to the Lord every time that you know your conscience is pricked of the Holy Ghost because His conscience does not let you down. It don't let you down. It's linked right there with him. And he identifies it right straight to your heart. And unless you fix it, unless you repent, can you find peace? Do you have peace with God? No, you don't, have, you don't have peace. If there's some attitude inside of you, some uh, offense, some bitterness or hatred that's there moving inside of you, do you find peace except that you come before the Lord and you get rid of it or you want, you want His sacrifice to relieve you of that? And you know, there's only one way he relieves you of it. Only one way. And that's, Lord, forgive them. Forgive me. Help me. Fix it. Remove it from me. And 
to the carnal conscience, it's impossible. But under this covenant, isn't it, isn't it real? Isn't it alive? You have faith in His sacrifice. You know it, it's not something you can explain. But whenever the Spirit of the Lord moves upon you and you make that sacrifice unto God, it all of a sudden, it just relieves you of all that pressure. And it's almost, it brings you back to the day that you first give your heart to the Lord. It brings you right back to that same clean heart that you first received. And you know I have peace with God. And then you have a you have a tool or I'll say a weapon that's given to you over your adversary. Because your adversary is the one that originated it. He's the one that originated whatever kind of a a, a Condition could enter in that uh, moves your heart and mind and emotions. That uh, adversary, he comes there, and you know, he's always wanting to resurrect it inside, but you got a tool, the peace of God that flows within your heart. That you can you can stop him right in his tracks, and you can cause that uh, that desire of your adversary to have to leave. And if you don't do it, then it James said it leads to more, right? So, but resist the devil, or is that Paul? can't remember. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God. That was James, wasn't it? And when you do it, when you battle your sin, see, that was what the Apostle Paul was talking about. Tommy made reference to it. Last time that he ministered, how the, the Apostle Paul was talking about said, that thing that I would do I do not, and the thing that I would not do that I do. Because you know the offering you want to be is the sweet savor to the Lord. But every now and then that kid shows up. And when the kid shows up in your conscience... That's that thing you would not do. You had no intention. No premeditated intention of it. But all of a sudden it's right there and you're dealing with that old man that you know is dead and buried. Just refer to Brother Steele's. <laughs> you know, he's dead and buried. I know he was dead and buried. I was there when they buried him. I'm an eyewitness to it. And what rose up out of that water was not that guy. It's the guy that I want to be, the sweet savor unto the Lord. He always wants to do the perfect will of God. And the Lord works intimately in our heart. He wants us to be that sacrifice. That's the reason he's made this provision of this kids of the goats for a sin offering. I write unto you, brothers, that you sin not. But if you do sin, you have an advocate. All you got to do is go before the Lord and say, forgive me. And you know what he does? The priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits. He picks up that loaf. 
He picks up that sacrifice, that sin offering, and he waved it before the kingdom of God, the, before the heavenly host. And he says, look at that, my son. He's called out in faith, washing his sin in the blood of the Lamb. He identifies that faith you place in the sacrifice he made. And he makes a show of it before the Lord. He looks down and he celebrates. You're, and I have to say, in all heaven, celebrate. So well, all heaven rejoices. The angels rejoice over one sinner that comes to the Lord. Well, they rejoice every time that you have to make that sacrifice <laughs> and you yield yourself to the leading of the Spirit of God because it is your conscience. You know, this is going on in your habitation. It's your walk with Him. And this old flesh wants to invest itself in us as much as it can and remain. But to have the full expectation of that harvest, I realize more is required of me than is required to others. <laughs> you better believe it. Because you are living in that generation that the end has come upon. How he measures all the rest, you and I, that's not our concern. But how he's going to measure me right here, and here we are right at the end of the, right at the end of the age. Time is soon going to close out this age, uh, the seven church ages, this age of this new covenant as it is applied today. And there's a convocation that's going to be called or going to be gathered, a harvest of the Lord is going to be gathered right at that end. And I don't want to just have a feeling that I might be raptured. <laughs> That's how some of them are at work. Well, I, I do the best I can. You know, and half the time they're cussing like sailors and everything like that. And they say, well, we do, I do the best I can and everything. I believe in God. I believe in all this. And, I, and well, I try to do good. And uh, maybe when he comes, he'll find me ready to go. <laughs> I told one boy, one time, I said, maybe <laughs> you need to get a little more sure than that. <laughs> you can be a little more sure than that. You can, you can understand and know because he, he comes intimately to you and he's very concerned with your life and concerned that you make it. That's his objective, to finish the work in you. The priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord. With the two lambs, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. And you shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be an holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. This age will come to an end. 
The work that he's doing now. Paul said at one time, the day is far spent. And that was 2,000 years ago. <laughs> he didn't realize how much was going to pass by. But we have history behind us and how the word of God reflects and declares. We have these feasts laying before us and they're declaring us the time. And we know the day is far spent. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Age after age after age as it passes by, they left us a little more. They left the next generation more. There was some that went on. And it didn't matter what the devil threw at them. The Lord had, he had gleanings for them after they left out of that first stage and they were facing that red horse rider through martyrdom. The Lord, he provided gleanings from that harvest that had been laid down and it's carried from age to age to age and here we are in the last days with the seventh day just looking at us right here for the end because really brother and sister when you get here this long summer is gone and the Feast of Trumpets starts taking place on the first day of the seventh month. And I kind of look at it in this manner, you know, uh, since I've got the computer, you can go on like Google Maps. And you can punch up Google Maps. And the first thing that it shows, you know, it, it, as it comes up is like a panoramic view of the United States. You can see, you can see a, a number of states, sometimes all of them, it's such a wide view. Well, that's really what you get with all this, with these, because this was back in history that it was established. And it's just an overall view of what the Lord's going to do in the work. But then, as you're there on that, on the, uh, looking at that map, you can kind of center... Baldwin County, or you can put uh, Mobile Bay right there in the center, and you can hit Zoom. And when you hit Zoom and you bring it up, it brings you right to Baldwin County. And you can look there, and it'll start describing what, what you saw from that first view of panoramic. It wasn't much detail. But then whenever you see and you bring it into Zoom there on Baldwin County, it'll show you the different cities, Fairhope and Baymanette, and all the dots where they are, and it'll bring it right there into focus. And that's really what the Lord did with these feasts. As he declared what his work is going to be, and it all started right there at the crucifixion of Christ, and just five weeks later, Six weeks later, they come and they had the Feast of Pentecost. Well, seven weeks went <laughs> later. They had the Feast of Pentecost and it started the kingdom of God. And it tells you in those feasts what the work of God is going to be. And that in the seventh day, there will be a holy convocation. And this says, in the seventh day, a holy convocation. And it speaks of those seven weeks. And then it takes you to the Feast of Trumpets in the seventh month. And it's like the Lord just brings you zoom. And that seventh month is saying the same thing as what it's bringing it into focus that it's tied to that seventh church age of time. And the Lord's going to give detail of what he's doing in our generation living in this seventh age. Because whenever you look at the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, these are all things 
that have that are activated and they are accomplished in this church age time or leading up to this this here is actually going a reflection of what the millennia is going to be but right in here it tells you at the beginning is a holy convocation and at the end is a holy convocation and brother and sister Right here at the beginning, that beginning of the Holy Convocation, that's when you see Jesus Christ coming back. And you see him gathering all the dead. And that's where it said, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. And that part is over. But there's also going to be a, a group of people that go all the way through the millennial kingdom and into the eternal day. And they're precious in the sight of the Lord what he's going to do so we're going to start looking in the weeks of course uh, uh, brother Larry was telling me that uh, brother Cooper contacted me. I will be calling him in the next day or so that he's planning planning to come down and visit next week and so if he comes down and visits next week he'll he'll he better come a day early if he wants to play because because Sunday, Sunday he'll work and uh, look forward to what the Lord will lay upon our brother's heart. And, uh, and I'll pray and make sure that he, he makes his, uh, that he has his plans and that he's informed so, so that he will be ready. And so whenever we get a, the opportunity, we'll go back and we'll start looking at how the feast of trumpets. Because to me... Um, it's important because the Lord, he's, he's laid here. This is a time indicator of his plan. It, it is from the past point of the Passover. He's, he's given a time scale, not in years, but in seasons, so that you can be aware and be ready for his coming. And, you know, I... It's not my intention to try to be any kind of confrontational. I just want you to be aware of seasons. And uh, whatever else benefits you, uh, that are others. But, uh, you know, you can't just keep finding times to work out calculations to try to, to try to fit the plan of God to what you want it to calculate to. The Lord didn't necessarily ask us to do that. Brother Jackson had his purpose in what he was doing, but even he believed it was for um, more than what, uh, you know, more precise than what it proved to be with 2004. What happened in 2004 and a half wasn't what he expected and what he presumed would happen in those things. And so, but this here, I can guarantee you, this is going to alert you because God's the one that figured this one out. He's the one, and I don't, I don't uh, say that to uh, say Brother Jackson didn't figure things out. He certainly did. I, I have full expectation of that era of the miraculous taking place and I have full expectation knowing that that 70th week of Daniel is going to be take, take place and that the Lord is going to have two prophets and all those things are going to happen that we understand are there but he couldn't get it precise and I don't want to try to get it precise with him on it. I'd rather just know how these are going to alert. Because there's a way that these this feast of trumpets was observed that lets you understand. And I'll just I'll just say it like this. It was a very special feast. Because you know Israel used trumpets for a lot of things. 
and to call meetings and holy convocations and things. But on the Feast of Trumpets, they started blowing in the morning and they blowed continuously the whole day. At the morning sacrifice, at the, at the morning time, they started blowing and it was a constant blow of the trumpets the whole day through till the time of the end of the age. I say, brothers and sisters, the trumpets are still blowing. We're still in the seventh age. And it sets a shadow and a pattern because it started right at the beginning of this age. And that was timed by God. That wasn't timed by man. It was timed by God. And, it, and it, it's precise. And so if he was so precise in how that was applied and that was applied and that was applied, that it happened right at the precise time it had to happen. Then everything else that he had is going to be something you need to give attention to and keep in your heart. And so I pray that the Lord will, will guide my words and help me because I don't, I don't want to be uh, confrontational in no way. I just want to, I want to help you in the days that's ahead and, and what we're looking at. So may the Lord bless you. a debt he did not owe and I owed a debt I could not pay I needed someone to wash my sins away and now I sing a brand new song amazing
Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Brother Paul, you want to dismiss?